Welcome to the first Pathway to 17 Summit, focusing on leading inclusive and equitable economies. We're very pleased to have so many delegates from across the globe. So I won't say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, first of all, a massive thank you to Digital Frontiers and the Alliance for Digital Finance Associations for putting together the summit. I'm Paul Hobden, the CEO of Gateway and I will be the moderator for this first live session, the first of 34 live sessions. Before introducing our speaker, just a few points um, to help you. You can navigate and select from the agenda uh, on the swap card system to allow you to see what events that you can attend. There's also networking sessions, and there you can meet uh, and submit to summit moderators, as well as the Alliance of Digital Financial Associations and its founding members. Uh, and you can also view information about the Alliance and exhibitors on the exhibitors page. And with that, I would like to introduce Sheila to you. Sheila is a lifelong learner and head of the Open Learning Campus at the World Bank in Washington, DC. She serves as the organization's focal point on digital learning and the issues at the intersection of technology use and education in emerging countries. She's internationally recognized thought leader, advisor, author, and a forward-thinking senior educator with over 35 years of experience in leading capacity building, knowledge management, data, social learning and transformation, and change across the public and private organizations. Sheila has been responsible for designing and implementing world-class solutions in challenging global environments, resulting in performance and productivity improvement. Sheila also provides policy advice and technical assistance to the World Bank country-level capacity building programs, both government and training centers of excellence, seeking to introduce technologies into the educational systems. East Asia, China, the Middle East, and North Africa, as well as across Africa and South Asia. A recent MOOC designed under her leadership on future of work was nominated for the prestigious edX prize for 2020. The current areas of interest include skilling and the fourth industrial revolution, 60 year curricula, corporate talent management, diversity and inclusion, organizational development MOOCs, experiential pedagogy, online hybrid strategies, multi multimodal and social learning environments, immersive learning, and the use of artificial intelligence in education. She has written articles for various peer reviewed publications and journals, uh, and has recently been published a book titled Reimagining Digital Learning for Sustainable Development, How Upskilling Data Analytics and Educational Technology Close the Skills Gap. She's on the advisory board of many major professional associations of learning, such as the Canadian Foreign Service Institute, Global Distance Learning Network, Indian National Skills Development Council, and the International Conference on E-Learning. We welcome Sheila and look forward to her presentation. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the Pathways 17 Summit, which focuses on developing skills and capacity amongst professionals in the sectors aligned to the 17 UN SDG goals. This summit comes at a very opportune moment, as today, globally, there are some key drivers of change happening around us, like shaping the world of work, skilling, and capacity building in general. There's a big reset and reimagination happening globally, if you will. My brief presentation today will focus on the global imperative for massive skilling and upskilling and the crucial role of capacity development, navigating the unprecedented change happening around us, closing the skills gap, and also the fundamental changes and shifts that's happening in how 21st century learning evolves in the way we teach, learn, credentialize, assess, and support. 
after this video, I hope we have a chance to, to have a Q&A session. Let's start by first discussing briefly the global imperative for massive skilling and upskilling for both individuals and institutions. Today, there are several social and environmental drivers at play. The most important driver is the fourth industrial revolution, which is disrupting the future of work on a global scale. McKinsey estimates that about 45% of the jobs today will be lost to disruptive technology within the next 10 to 20 years, and these will be mostly numerous low-skill, low-income jobs that are routine. Almost the entire workforce, therefore, needs to be ready to reskill and upskill as and when needed and required by career disruptions that will be accompanied by many new emerging job opportunities. Two, achieving the SDGs by 2030 is a global commitment by all particularly important for the digital frontier community. And these require investing massively in human capital through continuous learning opportunities for all, ranging from policymakers to ordinary citizens, from elected representatives to service delivery providers, from civil society to the general public, as well as youth. Third, developing nations are experiencing the youth budge. For example, India needs and China as well, but India needs to find job for about 12 million youth entering the job market every year. These people are confronted with fewer job opportunities unless there is an ecosystem available to them to continuously reskill and upskill. Finally, there is the challenge of climate change, which is already unpending lives and livelihoods in many parts of the world. Extreme weather events that used to occur once in say 100 years, such as prolonged drought, storm surges, snow storms, hurricane, now occur with disturbing regularity around the globe and in unexpected ways. So learning how to substitute renewable clean energy for fossil fuels or how to build community resi resistance and resilience to climate-induced weather events require behavior change that affects lifestyles, and also impacts livelihood. Therefore, skilling and upskilling becomes a priority for all global citizens, rich and poor alike. Changing attitudes and beliefs requires raising awareness, enhancing skills, sharing knowledge, and just-in-time capacity building. At the same time, there is unprecedented change happening around us. Technology is everywhere. There is a tsunami of data. AI, cognitive computing, robotics are disrupting work. And there are five generations in the workforce with millennials making up about 50% of the workforce. The other point to note is that the average tenure in a job is shorter and the skill life or the shelf life of skills, according to the World Economic Forum is just 4.5 years. So in the old economy, life existed in three simple blocks. You educate yourself for the first 20 years, then you work for another 40 years, and then you retire. And lifespan was about 73 years old. Looking ahead, the challenge is to prepare learners for jobs that don't exist today. For example, who would have thought that desirable job opportunities today um, has attracted more than 4 million app developers in India, 400,000 organic farmers in Uganda, and 100,000 youth as data laborers, according to a World Bank 2020 study. So now in the new economy, since the shelf life of skills are so short, what is to be expected? People are living longer, almost until 90. So the learning block is now lifelong or life-led. An individual needs to move in and out of work, learning and retooling periods. In fact, when I spoke to colleagues, of the hiring colleagues of the Silicon Valley recently, they mentioned that they don't hire for programming skills like uh, Java and so on. They hire if a person has learning agility. In fact, Chris Deedy, professor at Harvard, who has a chapter in my recent book, talks about a 60-year curriculum 
where moving in and out of work and learning and retooling is the theme of this chapter. This 60-year meta-curriculum is a new way of thinking about education and capacity building that's flexible, nimble, and adapts the, to the realities of frequent job disruptions with a focus on capabilities and skills, not just on degrees and qualifications. So capacity building institutions need to design creative and flexible offerings available throughout one's work life and not during an initial period of, of learning. And as you can well imagine, each element in the 60 year curriculum will be mediated by new forms of technology. Skills are the new currency of this age. As we mentioned, the technology changes propelled by the fourth industrial revolution is making many existing competencies and skills redundant. However, it's also opening up new sustainable career opportunities for those who have cultivated the right skills, the expertise, the mindset that adapt to these changes. And these new skills attach value to life skills as well. In fact, even more or as important as technical skills that include teamwork, creativity, innovation, uh, as essential to survive in a digital age. Therefore, um, closing the skills gap, the massive skilling need that I just talked to you about, given the scale of the challenge, traditional approaches, in-person approaches to teaching and learning will not help solve the problem. We need to leverage technology as, as a possible solution to provide high quality blended learning at massive scale so this brings us to the question, the future of work and learning is already here. Are we ready? And really this illustration that um, I had developed as a foundation for my book um, depicts uh, the shifts. The, we talked about the environmental and social drivers, uh, but then I will unpack for you what are the major shifts in learning. Uh, what are the ed tech enablers that support these shifts, including the innovative pedagogy, and then the evolving 21st century learning approaches. So the coming together of COVID-19 and the massive skilling challenges generated by the fourth industrial uh, has uh, compelled the world to reimagine their learning models very quickly. And so today, it's no longer a question of whether ed tech is a viable option, but it's really the question of how soon do I get started and how do I go about the transformation? So let me unpack the shifts in learning. So we talked about, uh, there's a lot of innovation in learning happening globally. And I'm sure many of you would agree that there's more change in learning that's happened in the last 10 years than in the last 100. And in fact, it's our learners who are leading and pushing innovation as they expand and evolve their approaches to creativity, curiosity, and discovery. So we already talked about learning moving away from one phase to continuous and lifelong. And this is essential to keep up with the changing knowledge and skills and the changing labor market. The second shift is really the move to look at learning more holistically, no longer as just formal classes, but those that encompass both classroom, digital, as well as in-person, but also informal and peer-to-peer -peer and on the job. And what this leads to is a change role for the learner and the facilitator. The learner is really moving away from individualistic to team-based. And the expert now is not uh, a sage on the stage, but more of an enabler, a facilitator, rather than the font of all knowledge. The sh third shift is really a huge focus on cross-sectoral and hybrid skills. So, you know, we live in a world where everything is linked to everything else. For example, an urban planner would need to know, uh, be knowledgeable about climate models, energy efficiency, smart transport option, while retaining deep technical expertise on urban and spatial planning. So cross-sectoral learning is very important. Um, and uh, the fourth, fourth shift is around modular education and micro-credentials. So really the benefits of modularity is that, um, you know, when you need to refresh your skills continuously, as we said earlier, because of the change, 
This calls for unbundled, simpler, modular approaches. And the benefits of such modularity is that learners can construct their own customized learning pathway, mixing and matching like Lego blocks, those learning modules and specializations and badges and micromasters and massive open online courses based on their own unique job requirements, interests, career prospects, and so on. So credentializing is also becoming very shorter, compact programs, giving flexibility to the lifelong learner. And, um, and finally, I think, you know, we all in this VUCA environment, uh, we're all looking for, you know, the, the growth mindset that enable people to uh, acquire, keep an open mind, unlearn as things may become redundant and learn new things, but that which is built on a foundation of digital, um, uh, digital skills, and as well as uh, power skills, as we mentioned, such as teamwork and communication and collaboration. So we talked about the shifts. Now let us look briefly at what are the edtech enablers that are enabling us to you know, advance digital learning, improve the efficiency, the effectiveness and the equity. And really we're in a new age of digital and blended learning where many of the challenges of the previous version um, have, are starting to become uh, be overcome. So the first enabler is cloud computing. Adult learners, including those from rural areas and fragile states, are taking advantage of the internet to acquire knowledge from elite institutions thousands of miles away. And cloud is one such technology that empowers the educational industry to shift from physical to virtual, came in really handy during COVID. And in addition to reducing operational costs and providing secure access to learning opportunities, the pay-as-you-go model allows institutions to flexibly scale up during peak usage and scale down when needs are low. So education, as I said, institutions are increasingly using this to increase responsiveness, um, innovation, inclusiveness, and impact. The second is um, enabler, which we are seeing, is the learning experience systems and integrated platform. With the shift to continuous learning, as well as a more holistic definition of learning to include microlearning, on the job, social, the traditional learning platform as the LMS we used to call it no longer fits the bill. New integrated end-to-end -end platforms are emerging that include crucial functions for the modern learner, which includes skills, experience, credential management, assessment, collaboration tools, content marketplace, e-commerce, and such. So really to put learning squarely in the hands of the learner, these learning experience platform, also called LXPs, emerged and provide this Netflix type of interface that use artificial intelligence and machine learning to analyze preferences and learner interaction, and then um, uh, provide to them a curated set of content from diverse sources. Um, the, the next enabler is, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is going to tremendously shape and reimagine the learning experience, particularly moving us away from lecture style, uh, lecture style presentation and one size fit all learning to deep, deep personal and adaptive learning. It, it can help us place learn, the learner at the center of the experience and provide individual learning paths that recognize their pre-existing skills and allows the learner to move at their own pace with tailored activities. Now, there are many other applications for AI, including chatbots and multilingual uh, translations and so on, but we won't have time to cover that. Another uh, enabling technology we will see a lot of, and we've been hearing a lot of news uh, over the last few weeks, is this whole area of metaverse. In other words, immersive extended reality that includes uh, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. And really, the metaverse or the extended reality is an umbrella term that describes an environment that merges both the physical and the virtual dimension to facilitate immersive learning environments. So uh, two common technology is AR and VR, 
uh, AR is augmented reality, which uh, overlays virtual objects such as image and text uh, into the real world. And so an example of this is that um, somebody could learn about the solar system, explore the sun, the planets, the satellites, and so on. VR, on the other hand, facilitates a fully immersive experience involving virtual object in a simulated environment, uh, such as flying a plane or swimming underwater and so on. But um, this is something that is becoming uh, lower cost, easier availability, and in the next few years, we will see a lot of learning move to immersive uh, simulations, which, which really improves uh, the ability to trial and error, learn from mistakes, and also learn from actual experiences. And, and the final enabler is learning analytics, the data um, to track learner interactions and mind collect and analyze and report on learner interactions. Uh, and what this does, it, it not only helps predict performance like pass, fail, need support, it reduces dropouts, it increases retention, and uh, in a way, it also enables you to, uh, the beauty of the digital and blended environment is that every click and every movement uh, is recorded and that can be um, used to make the learning experience um, more efficient. And um, 21st century learning approaches is what I want to end with. And so certainly um, the blended approach that we talked about, a combination of in-person and online, um, and the, the, the verdict is still, it's, I think moving, once we get back from COVID, that will be where um, most people, the, the new normal will be blended learning. Now what we blend and how we blend it will depend on the audience, the, um, the outcomes of the learning experience and so on. And within a continuum of technology-based learning, different forms of blended uh, could include just a flipped classroom, it could include hybrid, it could include um, high flex, which is having the same um, instruction available both to in-person and remote. So a lot of um, how it will evolve is up in the air, but definitely blended is here to stay. Um, active learning is the next that, you know, we're already doing a lot of it, but Many of, the, many of the tools I mentioned. I'd like to end with a brief mention of my book as requested. Um, my book titled Education Technology for Sustainable Development, How Upskilling, Data Analysis, and Digital Interventions Foster Lifelong Learning was published in June 2021 by Routledge, New York, and Oxford. The core theme of the book is, is actually around Alvin Toffler's quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be the one who cannot read or write, but the one who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The book targets emerging country practitioners, stakeholders who support capacity building, um, practitioners, uh, knowledge and learning and skill development council, and government officials, um, as well as private sector and edtech startups. Uh, in my career, long career at the World Bank and external, I've had the privilege of heading the Open Learning Campus. And when I talk to many of the stakeholders in emerging countries, they've experienced, expressed time and time again uh, on, on the question of how do we think about moving from a brick and mortar ecosystem to a digital and blended, and how can we modernize learning by harnessing education technology? So this book is really about uh, target senior leaders, about changing mindsets and how to get started, how to navigate the choppy waters of market-driven digitization and how to incorporate unique community and local priorities to build quality learning institutions. It has about 27 chapters curated by most influential thinkers, practitioners, uh, providing strategic direction and guidance on how to effectively harness the power of technology for learning to solve some of the complex development challenges and to meet the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, for that excellent presentation, really thoughtful, uh, gets get us really thinking. 
Um, the, the first question really, and, and Combe brings this point to us, is around how do we manage the digital divide um, of those people in the most rural areas where there is limited connectivity, if any connectivity and access to, to devices is so limited. And, and we know it's going to change. I can look out in the evening and see uh, Elon Musk's satellites coming. But for the moment, how do we uh, bring those people along with us? Thank you, uh, Paul, for that question. Um, I will start out by saying that uh, a lot of what I was speaking about and a lot of the work done by the World Bank's Open Learning Campus uh, is not targeted towards that very rural areas, but targeted towards policymakers and practitioners uh, who will avail of the knowledge and learning activities and capacity building activities to improve policy and so on. But having said that, I think um, your question is valid and I will answer it on a more general basis that, uh, um, as you know, the, the technology is improving in the sense that connectivity as well has improved tremendously in the last 10 or so years. And my own experience, um, even in the World Bank, it has been that, uh, you know, the, the digital compression techniques, the platforms we offer have made it um, better possible. So I'll give you an example, which is happening today is um, in the last uh, five years, we find 25% of our participation in the open learning courses from Africa. So that tells you a lot that, um, that this is possible. And I would, I would have said that previously, this has not been the case. So there are improvements happening in terms of, and we also, um, to, to the extent possible without losing engagement or interactivity, we try to design to that uh, lowest common denominator in terms of technology to make sure people are not left behind. We offer offline resources. Um, we offer low bandwidth options as well. Thanks, Sheila. I think the, the exciting bit is just the, the giant steps that the technology takes and it often can kind of leapfrog us uh, to the solution. Uh, I know we are, are, are limited on time, but just one other area I thought that would be interesting to explore is in this world, as you describe, where we need to be lifelong learners, um, how important is it actually to ensure that um, whoever is participating learns the skill of learning digitally? Uh, that's a fantastic question, Paul. Uh, and, I, and I would just phrase it as not just learn digitally, but learn the skills to learn. Uh, which is often called metacognition. And, and I think, um, as I gave you in that example um, that I talked about pre-COVID, I was doing a keynote at Microsoft and in chatting with everybody, they said, today we're not hiring for the knowledge of programming of this new program or that, we're, learning for, uh, we're hiring for learning agility. Uh, meaning a person can learn, unlearn, relearn things quickly, uh, are the types of people that um, are better, um, about the, who are in demand, basically. And so more important than ever uh, today, where the shelf life is short, 4.5 years, um, where people really need to master the skills, as I said, uh, to, to reskill or which requires unlearning as well. And in the sectors I work in, it's not so much relearning new skills that are problematic, but it's unlearning uh, the stuff that you already have take those out of, of your head and replace them with new ideas. And again, having a growth mindset uh, and having this desire to learn and um, making sure that um, they build these skills to quickly uh, learn new skills is going to be very important moving forward as we continue to be lifelong learners for a long time. Sheila, thank you very much for your presentation today and for answering these questions. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time, um, but we'd really like to thank you and thank all the delegates for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Paul, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the Pathways to 17. 
um, good luck to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.